So talking about the electrons of an atom, remember that the electrons hang out in a cloud around the nucleus and they, they reside in what are called orbitals or shells. So orbitals, um, orbitals exist at different sort of distances from the center of the atom and if you think about the charges, so electrons are negatively charged, the nucleus of the atom is positively charged, so where do the electrons want to go? They want to get as close as possible to that nucleus. So it tends to be that the innermost orbitals get filled first with electrons, and then once it's full, um, the ne next electrons that try and join up, they're going to join the, the next shell that's a little bit further away. Okay, so atoms pack in from the center outwards. And it turns out that the innermost shell, or the innermost orbital, it can only hold two electrons. Okay? Once we go beyond that innermost shell, the next shells can hold eight electrons. This is going to help us understand bonding a little bit better. Um, I need to mention one caveat here. So this is true for the, the types of elements that we will be dealing with for the most part in biology. This isn't necessarily true for all elements in chemistry, um, but the ones that we'll be dealing with, this is what you'll need to know about them. So innermost shell can hold two electrons, other shells can hold eight. So if we think about this in terms of stability, Atoms are very stable when their outermost shell is filled with electrons. So if we look at this hydrogen atom right here, okay, hydrogen has one proton and one electron ordinarily. That means that its outermost shell okay, right here, it just has one electron. It's capable of holding two electrons in this shell. Okay, innermost shells can hold two electrons. So hydrogen could take on another electron. And this is why hydrogen tends to form single bonds. Hydrogen can bond to one other thing. Um, that's because it can take on one additional electron. Let's switch down here to carbon. So carbon has an atomic number of six. It's number six on the periodic table. And in terms of um, where are its six electrons, let's just start from the inside and work our way out. So there are two electrons in the innermost shell, right? Fits with this rule, two electrons in the innermost shell. And then the next shell is going to hold the rest of its electrons. So we've got one, two, three, four in the next shell. This shell is capable of holding eight electrons. So what does that mean? That means that carbon can take on four additional electrons into this outermost shell. Carbon, in fact, tends to form four bonds when it bonds with other things. Okay, so um, important things to note. These electrons in the outermost shell, we refer to those as valence electrons. And it's the valence electrons that participate in bonding. They get shared between atoms in order to form a bond. Okay, so chemical bonds. There are a few different types of chemical bonds. All of them will involve the valence electrons. Let's take a look at the different types of chemical bonds. The first type, and the strongest type of bonding, is called covalent bonding. Covalent bonds happen when, um, when a valence electron is shared between two atoms. Okay, so there are a couple of different possibilities here. The sharing could be an equal sharing, in which case we'd be talking about a nonpolar bond. That's the type of bond that exists between two hydrogen atoms. This is hydrogen, uh, hydrogen gas, H2. It's just two hydrogen atoms connected together, and they're just sharing their individual electrons. So we've got a, a bond that has formed here. It's a covalent bond, and it is nonpolar. It's an equal sharing between these two atoms. Another type of covalent bond that could happen is a polar covalent bond. And in this case, there's an unequal sharing of the electron involved. So this is the type of bonding that we see in water. Um, what we've got here is an oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms, one here and one over here. And oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. What that means is just that oxygen can pull electrons closer to itself than hydrogen is capable of doing. So it tends to happen that the electrons are shifted a little bit closer to oxygen, and consequently, we end up with a partial negative charge on this end of the molecule, and partial positive charges over here where the hydrogens are at. Okay, so there's a partial negative 
and a partial positive over on this end of the molecule. So that's a polar molecule. It's due to that polar covalent bond that forms between oxygen and hydrogen. We're going to come back to this polarity in just a little bit. It has a number of um, very important consequences. Okay, so covalent bonds, that's our first type of bond. Our second type of bond is not quite as strong. Um, it is an ionic bond. And ionic bonds, again, they also involve valence electrons, but what happens in this case is instead of sharing a valence electron, instead the valence electron completely gets transferred from one atom to another. Let's take a look with a picture. So what we have here is a sodium atom. Sodium has 11 protons and 11 electrons ordinarily. If we're just talking about an atom. And so if you map out those electrons in the orbitals, okay, two in the innermost, eight in the next one, that leaves just one electron hanging out in the outermost shell. So how could this atom um, become more stable? Well, either it could take on seven additional electrons, or it could just give up that one electron in its outermost shell. Okay, and that would result in a complete outer shell. So that's exactly what sodium does. It tends to donate that one electron. It's going to give it away. And what's it going to give it to? Well, whatever will accept it. Um, here we have a chlorine atom nearby. Chlorine is atomic number 17. It happens to be missing just one electron from its outermost shell. So what happens is that electron from sodium gets donated over to the chlorine atom, and now they are both ions. Okay, so let's switch, switch down to here. Here we have a sodium ion. It's given up an electron. Here we have a chloride ion. It's taken on that extra electron. And so these are two ions. This one is positively charged. This one is negatively charged. Uh, the end result of that is that these are very attractive to each other. The positive is attracted to the negative, so they tend to stick together. And that's called an ionic bond. Ionic compounds, uh, we're going to be encountering these quite a bit. This particular ionic compound is called sodium chloride. This is just table salt. And table salt is an important part of your diet in limited quantities. We need a small amount of, of salt in our diets. We'll be seeing why that's the case as we go forward here. Ionic compounds, it turns out, are very soluble. They can dissolve in water. And that's also going to be very important in the physiology that we'll be seeing. Um, if we take a look back at uh, the water molecules. So we said water has polar, polar bonds involved. And this is very important for being able to dissolve ionic compounds. So whether we're dealing with a positive ion or a negative ion, okay, regardless, water can be attracted to it. Why is that? Well, over here we've got the negative ends of the water molecules, right, oriented towards the charge. Okay, so negative is attracted to positive. Over here, what's going on? We have the positive ends of the water molecules oriented towards the negative charge. Okay, so either way, regardless of if we are dealing with a cation or an anion, either way, water molecules tend to group around them. And consequently, if water sort of squeezes in between, what's going to happen is the sodium ion and the chloride ion, they'll get sort of pulled apart from each other. And this is how salt dissolves. If you put it in water and you stir it for a while, eventually it's going to go into solution because water is doing this very thing. It's separating those ions from each other. The third type of chemical bond that we need to remind you about is hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is a special consequence of the polarity um, of, the, of the water molecules that we have already talked about. So if we look at water molecules, right, we've already described that they have a negative end and a positive end due to the fact that oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. And if we have multiple water molecules present in the same vicinity together, what happens is the negative end of one water molecule will get attracted to the positive end of another. And that attraction right there, that is called a hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bonds are weak attractions. If we look at them individually, um, they always involve polar bonds. So the molecules involved have to have a polar bond. And always they involve hydrogen. 
okay, so always hydrogen is involved. The other atom in the other molecule, it could be oxygen or it could be another sort of electronegative atom, such as nitrogen. The most frequent place we'll be seeing this is in the case of water, so that's why I'm just showing you a picture of water right here. Uh, but hydrogen bonding can show up in other places as well. I'll give you a, a few examples of that in just a moment. Okay, so what are hydrogen bonds responsible for? Water has a lot of special properties, and that the special properties in large part are due to hydrogen bonding. The fact that water has surface tension is due to this hydrogen bonding. So the surface of the water is, is very cohesive. It tends to stick together. Um, so when we can have things like bugs that are able to float on the water. They don't sink into it. And that's because the water molecules right underneath the legs um, those water molecules are sort of like sticking to each other. They're holding on to each other. They're not letting go. They're not letting the, the bug's leg sort of sink in. Um, so surface tension is due to hydrogen bonding. Also capillary action. This is very important in plants for sure. How do plants bring up water from the ground? Well, they have these little tubes, right? And the tubes carry the water upwards. Um, that's the, the, in large part, the way that that can occur is because the water molecules hold on to each other as they move upwards, as they're attracted to the walls. Um, okay, so a couple of other things. The fact that ice floats, this is actually due to the hydrogen bonding structure. So when ice, or excuse me, when water freezes and forms ice, what happens is all of those hydrogen bonds stabilize into a very sort of intricate structure here. Um, you probably know this already. Ice is less dense than liquid water. And if you look at the molecular structures here, it makes sense. This is liquid water. All the water molecules sort of smushed up against each other. Here's ice. We have this very neat lattice work of water molecules arranged um, in a pattern. And these hydrogen bonds are what are stabilizing that structure. So if you think about that structure, Another very important thing about water is that it helps to regulate temperature on Earth. Um, so if you have a, if you have some ice, like in the ocean, if you have ice, then and suppose the atmosphere starts to heat up, the ice is going to be able to absorb a lot of that heat before it melts. It takes a lot of energy to break all of these hydrogen bonds. Okay, so ice does a very good job of regulating temperature, keeping the temperature uh, of the atmosphere from fluctuating too much. Coming back to our class, more specific to physiology, hydrogen bonds are also responsible for the structure, the three-dimensional structure of proteins. An example of this would be the hemoglobin that's in our red blood cells. Hemoglobin is critical for carrying oxygen throughout our bodies. And that three-dimensional shape is, due, is held um, in place due to hydrogen bonds. So hydrogen bonds come up in proteins. They also come up in DNA, just holding together complementary strands of DNA. Remember, those are hydrogen bonds there.